Welcome to the Mycroft Developer Sync on September 2nd. So, uh, we went through the Jira tickets last time, so this time we're just going to go ahead and uh, go around the, uh, the screen here and get updates on everyone, any blockers or exciting news that you have to share. So, I won't go first this time since apparently I'm a spoiler. Uh, and we'll let uh, Chris Vera go first. You've got to unmute yourself, say. Freaking grumble, grumble, growl, growl. Um, so <laughs> I did uh, submit a PR with uh, all of the stuff, the work I've done so far on the uh, the upload API endpoint. Um, so that is done, and I'm working on the uh, the script now that will take. The, the day's utterances and move them over. Um, I'm also uh, doing some work in documentation on the wake word tagger um, document. I did a little bit of work yesterday and I'll probably do some more um, today to uh, get us to a point where we can have another discussion on the design. Um, and uh, I am going to probably spend the next uh, work day or some of the next work day um, on a patent so that I have something like this to, <laughs> to talk about in tomorrow's meeting. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's All right, that's, that's what I like to hear. No blocker, everything's cruising along. Okay, great. Uh, Derek. Okay, so yeah, I've been mostly working on um, MK2-49 ticket, which is the full assembly of the first Rev 3D printed design for the SJ201, um, which is hopefully I'm still on track to finish that this by the end of this week. Um, I think it's going to be close, but I think, I think I can get it done. And then the other things I've been working on are uh, getting ready to um, assemble laser cut enclosures for uh, Chris and Ken and myself starting out. Uh, and the update from, from Kevin on that, uh, I think the last time we talked was like, whoa, we might have stuff like on route, um, but he ran into an issue, a short on one of the boards, I think that gave him pause. So he was going through some more robust testing. So he hasn't actually shipped um, the boards yet. So hmm, probably not with shipping time and stuff. Probably not gonna be able to get those until next week. Fully done. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's where I'm at. And it looks like uh, Michael kicked over some so one of the things Michael asked is that we can go ahead and share the laser cut enclosure design. Um, Kevin had some recommendations to make things a little easier to plug in, so I'll make those changes. But then I think we can share that out with the community, um, but we need to kind of tidy up our, our uh, naming system and our part numbers so we can figure out what we're gonna call like the laser cut versus the 3D printer versus the projection board and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, I, to be honest, I hate that stuff. I hate, <laughs> I just like, like, you know, Rev 1 dash, you know, August, whatever, you know, I just, I'm terrible about part numbers, but um, uh, yeah, we should figure out what's the best for that. <laughs> yeah, um, I, did you, are you you're talking about that because I, of the ticket that I gave you? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we can we can meet about that. Uh, it should be a short meeting. Yeah, I'm happy to adopt whatever system <laughs> you've yeah, got in mind because I I just, whenever I um it's up to me it's always the best. Um, but yeah. Okay. So we'll yeah, that. we've got a system outlined in the uh, in the Mark One repo. So I think we'll just go ahead and use that and see how it, how it stands up to actual uh, real world use case scenario. And okay. Uh, question about your three D. Print model is that a uh, FDM model or is that a 
Uh, yes. That's why. Uh, yeah. The idea. Well, the idea is to start with the FDM, like um, because that's the what you know the, most people will have access to in the community, but also do as much thinking as possible to align it towards um, injection molding as well to, to try and not make it that much different. So one thing I'm doing, for example, is going ahead and adding some draft and things like that that I think, like at least on the major drafts, uh, that will probably be needed for injection molders. Go ahead and put those in place. Um, you know, there are some accommodations you have to make for, for FDM. Generally, I'd like to be as close to, to the same as possible. Just from the standpoint of getting some early devices out there, I would love to. We've talked on regular regularly about making soft molds and doing resin casting, and just it's never become something we do. Um, I kit it up for all that here, so I would very much like to see if we can do these in resin in soft mold resin cast because we could get, you know, dozens and dozens of devices off the off the line and even if it's just for early adopters and developers and whatnot it would be great to have something that approximates the final injection molded uh, device yeah i think i mean that becomes that, that becomes a bit of a labor you know labor versus um you know 3d printing issue because the the, the uh, casting process is does take some labor so if we can give some, someone if we can find it help us do that um also in the size that we are going to be we are going to cast the size can be uh, um, but yeah uh, there's this this outfit johnny found that can print our whole enclosure in fdm so you know it's still going to have striations and such it's not going to be super smooth like an slf but really reasonable price so that's i think that's another way to look at it too you know, just farm them out to a uh, you know print farm and, and get get them for like 30 bucks a a set, which is like almost five times cheaper than the most uh, online services like Shakeway. All right, cool. So yeah, uh, we should we should weigh those two options for sure. <clears throat> right. Okay. Let's see, uh, kids. Um, yeah, then mostly we can continue with the 2008 release stuff, um, uh, which is all in place. I hit a little snag um, yesterday um, doing the final testing on um, one of the Mark 1s. The, the date time skill didn't update cleanly, um, but I uh, I think it was a one-off, um, so I've just been sort of retesting that to make sure it's good. Um, but I, there's nothing in the update that would actually cause that. Um, I think it was just a network issue. Um, but it does raise, it raised again with me that, you know, in the longer term, we need a way of recovering from those sorts of things better. Um, Is but anyway, so everything... Is this the conflict in the error log? Uh, this one was actually a, a, one of the Python packages didn't update, uh, didn't install. One of the new dependencies didn't install. Because um, that still which, was uh, showing a merge conflict in my error log. Uh, so that would be like if you, you know, if you change something on your device or are you editing the skills on the device or? No. Right. No. The version he has is the the, the KB version, so there might be some a problem with with, with that. Oh yeah, of course. That's yeah, my yeah. guess. Um Yeah. Have you anyway, uh I think I, yeah, I think that'll be a different issue, um for sure. Um anyway, so the twenty oh eight uh should be ready to push the button um pretty soon uh and everything else is in place there's a pr up for switching the marketplace over to 2008 as well um and given there's only one skill that's been removed from 2002 to 2008 that's you know 
it's a pretty innocuous change on the on the front end. Um, so we could merge that anytime, I think. Uh, yeah. Another exciting thing is that the um, the Mozilla Web Thing skill has been completely rewritten um, by community member James MF, um, who did that Rasa integration blog post a while ago, um, and so he's he's rewritten it um, with full common IoT support, um, which also raises that you know we still haven't released officially released the common IoT. Framework. Um, it, it's waiting on the. There's a control skill that, that goes along with it, um, which has some. I think Python 3.6 uh, specific code in it, which therefore doesn't run on all of our supported devices. So um, there's. It's, it's the final little piece um, in the common IoT framework that we have to get out there to actually have support for that. Um, but everything else is like all of the changes are already in core and everything. Um, but there is more community interest in that framework at the moment. So Home Assistant is already um, ported across, but they're you know waiting to, to switch until it's actually supported and, and that sort of stuff. So um, I created an epic for um, fully releasing common IoT um, and think that we should look at that at some point. Um, but it will mean bumping our supported Python version from yeah, like 3.5 to 3.7 to 3.6 to 3.8, which I think we need to do anyway as well. Um, yeah, I think that's it for the moment. So as part of your uh, 2008 release process, do you actually, uh, so clearly you're testing it on the Mark 1. Um, do you mm -hmm. test it on all the versions of the Mark One, like all, all the software versions. So, going back to the first, you know, if somebody's had a, a Mark One sitting on their shelf since they ordered it, and tomorrow is the first day they plug it in. Uh, <laughs> no, I I test it from like the original 2002 release, but I am not currently testing it from older releases. We, we could do that though. Well, are the releases? Uh, are they serial? So, like, in order to get to the 2008 release, do you, does the device have to first get to the 2002? And to get to the 2002, does it first have to get to the 1908? Or does it? Can it go from sure. like, you know, 1702 all the way to 2008 in one? It should be able to jump. Yeah. So we use we use dead packages for the for the Mark One. So, um, you know, Microsoft Core is, is just a package. So, you know, it doesn't ask to update and um, uses the latest table image and jump. Okay. Yeah. It would probably be a good idea to test more than just the most recent. But uh, it seems like we haven't had any problems. You know, mm. with it, right? Yeah, well, and, you know, we've, we've been supporting the Mark 1 for a long time time now and uh, you know I, I am very much a believer in continuing to support hardware that still works and and you know that's one of the great things about open source is that you know you don't have someone like uh, a certain speaker company just like arbitrarily turning your devices into bricks um, but uh, at the same time you know we need to we're going to obviously put a lot more um, time and effort into the Mark II, and and there's less time going to be going into the Mark One. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just needs but to be I think part it's of our definitely going for process. us to give out the. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, for the for the Mark for sure. II, for sure. You know, we, that needs to be. Yeah. You know, if we're going to obsolete, uh, you know, a piece of hardware, we need to let people know that well ahead of time and not do it just because they haven't updated it in a year. Mm -hmm. so. uh, okay, well, thanks. That sounds good. Um, and uh, so, Ken, you're on deck. All right, so um, 
file the bug, as, as you know, on the uh, screen and captured the log uh, output that shows where that error is. I didn't have a chance to fix that one. There was a couple other ones I fixed um, regarding the uh, timing issues with the bring-up sequence that I spoke with Chris V about. Um, Chris, that monkey patch I gave you is pretty self-explanatory, right? just says, at this point, if I don't have a handle the bus, go ahead and give me one, right, and save it. So that takes care of kind of the, uh, the bring up timing issue. Uh, I don't know if you want to incorporate that or if you have a different approach to that, to that issue. Um, there was something else that I saw in the log files when I fixed, but I can't remember it. Um, and then on the, uh, the power up issue, um, I've, I've isolated it down to, um, well, it could be a couple of things. It could be power related, like the power we're providing to the daughter board, but I doubt it. It probably is firmware, but it could also be the issues that they are very sensitive about regarding, like when you tell them something's not working on their forums, they want you to go back two or three kernel versions to where they're sure it's working, which means that there's, you know, they're not keeping up with the software. There's some differences in the way the USB ports are handled on the Pi 4. Uh, that being said, um, I'm working on a solution for it, a uh, brute force approach for now, because I don't really know what the problem is. But I, I did have it with the firmware version that it came out of the box with, that the, um, the factory reset run on it uh, at boot time would solve the problem, which is a bit of a brute force approach. I tried to rewrite that code a little bit to, instead of doing a factory reset on the board, just resetting the USB device at that level. I tried that via the low level USB drivers and via their actual, I figured out how they communicate using ioctals and stuff going over the USB channel, which will be the same way we'll do it for our board. Um, so I tried to create some code that would reset the device at, that, at both levels. Um, at the one level, at the USB level, it didn't work. At the device level, it bricked it for a while. But that turned out to be a problem where it reorganized the USB priority of the devices, and then it kept writing to the wrong place and getting a pipe error and all this foolishness. So uh, I'm trying to isolate it to whether it's firmware or whether it's the interface software between the card and the host. But in either case, I do know that, I mean, the brute force approach right now is if you flash the, you know, the firmware upon bootload, which is an extra, I don't know, 10 seconds in the boot up process, it never, it never appears. So, you know, I'm just not sure what the problem is yet. So I don't think that's the solution. I'm trying to get it at a reset device level, but you know, I suspect that when we have our board, we'll have similar issues. So I don't know how much time I want to spend on this. All right. So, you're, yeah, but you're, so you're, you're talking about the firmware of the the US the USB chip or the sound card or the the re speaker the re speaker. Talk board. about the XMOS chip then. Well, if the re speaker board's firmware is the equivalent to the XMOS chip, then that answer would be yes. Yes, that is the answer. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, I assume it's just like some shell. You know, we actually USB. we actually found an error in the reference design <laughs> that XMOS gave us, and uh, and Kevin was having some problems with this, so he had to redo the way the uh, the power supplies bring up because the XMOS chip is very sensitive to the order in which uh, the power supplies come online, and uh, holding its reset line low. So, um, uh, so. Uh, it, so it's sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't in, in the first version of the board. So in this, the most recent version, he's added another chip in there that guarantees that reset will you know remain low until the power supplies are stable in the right way. Uh, so we might not actually see this problem in the 201. Yeah, I mean it could be that, right? That's why I say it's you know it's it's in the bring up. I don't know if it's voltage. You know, the <coughs> other thing is with powered USB, sometimes downstream devices have trouble. Uh, so I don't really know what the problem is. I know how I can brute force fix it, which is to wedge in a, uh, you know, a firmware update every time we reboot the device. Uh, you know, and then, like I said, I, I'm working on potentially being able to reset it 
at a device level. Mm -hmm. The USB IOCL doesn't work, but their down low one does. Uh, it just borks the whole thing because you have to kind of tell the USB stack that I'm resetting this. It could also be the suspend. In 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 uh, Pi Four with these USB devices, there's a suspend mode it goes into where it goes into low power, mm -hmm. and it could be giving it trouble from that perspective. So I really don't know. Gotcha. Now that being said, um, you know I I don't know how far we want to go into this. Like I said, I have a solution for if it comes up and it doesn't work, I can give you commands to get it to work. Um, you know, and I don't know if we want to wedge that in at our boot process or not at this point. But I would be interested in taking a look uh, when Chris is done, seeing if the um, yes/no issue is uh, just their their skill or whether it's endemic across all skills. I could switch over to that too if you want me to look at that. Okay. Uh, well, we'll uh, we'll see how this goes. I'll check in again on Friday. If you figured it out today, then you know, I guess get in touch with Gez. Um, yeah, I did. Right. So. Yeah, I told Ken this, but I just want to remind everyone. I'll actually, I'm going to send out an email, which probably is a compliment to me too. Uh, when we get a board, a re-speaker microwave B2.0 board, we flash it for, you know, I have been, and, um, you know, Charlie was, flashing it over to a different firmware from the stock. It's the 40, it's on their, re, their repo. It's the 48K one channel firmware. And the reason we do so is because that one had much better playback audio than the stock uh, and handled higher bit rate audio playback and sounded way better. The original one sounded kind of like garbage. <laughs> um, so anyway, but the re-speaker people have, were actually fairly responsive when we asked questions about this, um, you know, back nine, 10 months ago. So can I can forward those previous correspondence if you want to reach out to them? I mean, it might not be at a point where you want to do that right now. No, but... anything would be helpful. The, the, the concern is I don't understand the architecture of the re-speaker board guts yet. So right. I know it has an XMOS chip on there. I know I can get to that XMOS chip using USB control packets that go over the USB line. Uh, I don't know if it has another processor on that board that's coordinating all of that and taking those commands and translating to the XMOS and then doing the ins and outs and timing, or if this is done in hardware, I assume it's done in software and firmware. So, so when we say firmware, I don't know that it has, in other words, I have the 48K and the 1K, the one channel and the six channel. I have all that firmware here as well. It's actually included in the Pi 4 under the USB for microarray subdirectory, and actually right. the code to to send out the commands to the hardware is there as well. But a lot of times there's a hard there's a there's a small microprocessor driving or or gluing the commands over USB to the XMOS chip. I don't know if that's the case here, so I'll have to look at it. So I just but yeah, any correspondence you have can only be helpful. Yeah. I think that'll be useful, and also Ken, I, you know, the, it's purportedly an open source uh, system. So there's uh, the link I just pasted in the chat over there is uh, an overview of the the board, so you can see the system diagram there. Very good. Yeah, I didn't have that one. Where the hell did this come from? Well, and and also I I just emailed that same link as well as the GitHub repo that has the firmware. Um, which, as you mentioned, Ken, is already in our image. Uh, it's in the folder already, but um, I gave you the repo too. So. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I've, I've visited the repo. I've actually modified their, uh, what is it called, dfu.py, the downloader. Uh, that's that's the code I basically took, took off. That has uh, the download capability, but if you dig around in there, it also shows you how to do a bunch of stuff, reset the device, Reset it to factory uh, mode, uh, take it offline, take it online, get status, send status, all that stuff. To it. So, um, yeah, and like I said, I was actually able to kind of pseudo brick it by sending out a reset device. So, yeah, um, just don't know yet. Um, still, still digging. That's where I'm at. Yeah. Okay. Well, I sent you the wrong link, but in that page, you can find the, uh, the right one. Ah, sorry. 
Uh, I actually pasted the wrong link in there, but from the link that I gave you, you can get to the right, the right one, um, which is the MicroRay 2.0 board. I think it's a circular board. Is that right, Derek? Yeah, that's it. That's it. So so, yeah, the, the MicroRay Respeaker MicroRay V2.0. Yeah. Yeah, I have that. I just haven't had a chance to dig into the schematics. And the other thing I haven't really had a chance to do yet is look at our schematics and the GPIO mappings and make sure that we're not doing something silly like sending out a byte to a GPIO port and not, you know, honoring the previous bit state and maybe accidentally setting something. So uh, I haven't had a chance. It's just reading and documentation for me at this point, just getting up to speed on stuff. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, so for my part, uh, let's see. Uh, we didn't talk about any updates on the Mark II hardware yet. Um, so the status on that is that uh, Kevin's got uh, his enclosure. It's all put together. He's got some some demo videos of it running. Uh, we're right now, um, we're basically we're in the process of, of tuning things at this point, uh, literally tuning because the audio isn't very good. So uh, we're gonna, he's running some tests on that. Um, and then uh, once he gets the boards over to us, uh, we can start working on the enclosure and the skills and whatnot to turn it into an actual Mycroft device. Um, but you know, he's got the whole system up and running uh, on the, you know, on the Raspberry Pi, playing, you know, full screen videos and, uh, you know, watching YouTube videos and playing music and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, so the hardware is all working, which is great. Um, so now it's job is to, to port our system onto it. Uh, I don't really have anything other than that. Uh, oh, that's not true. I have one more thing I wanted to talk about. So Ken uh, assigned me a ticket uh, this morning, I think, and um, he said he assigned it to me because he didn't know where it, where it should go and, uh, uh, you know, wanted to make sure we talked about it. So that's that's totally fine. That makes that makes sense. And uh, it had the desired result, which is that, uh, you know, I gave it some thought and uh, I realized that I, I also kind of have had this question. I kind of came up with my own solution and I'd like to discuss it with you guys. So the, so the issue is, that, so I've been coming up with some issues in terms of you know, either ideas for the upcoming sprint or bugs that might be in the current hardware or software. And the question is where to put these, right? So if it's an urgent bug, I've been assigning it to the person I think who is you know, most responsible for that. And then either putting it in the current sprint or the next sprint, right? Um, and so the question as to you know whether to put it in the current sprint or the next sprint is kind of you know it's a judgment call, um, but um, uh, but I think everyone gets notifications when you get a new ticket assigned to you, so you can take a look at those and either decide whether it's appropriate or not for the for the sprint it was given. Um, when I put something in the next sprint, so currently we're on 13, I believe, and uh, so the next one would be 14. That doesn't mean that I think it's necessarily going to be done in sprint 14. It just means that it can be part of our process of evaluating, you know, what our, our sprint planning process for next Monday, effectively, right? So, um, so just in terms of setting expectations there, if I stuck it in that sprint for with your name on it, it doesn't mean that I think we need to get it done in that sprint, uh, but we should talk about it. Um, and then there are some things that are just obviously going to be backlog issues, like oh, I've got this great idea, you know, we should do this, you know, but uh, you know, it's not it's not a burning need. Those things you don't have to put into a sprint; they'll just go in the backlog, and we'll, we'll find them, you know, when we're setting up our sprints. So, or uh, but I do think it is useful to assign them to epics. So, uh, if you don't assign it to a sprint, then maybe you should assign it to an epic, or you know, both. Obviously, if that's applicable. Um, but almost everything we do these days, uh, there's an epic for it. Um, and if there isn't, then maybe think about making one. So that's what I wanted to say about that. Any any thoughts or comments? Um, one comment for me is that uh, about Monday, which is Labor Day, um, we're planning on meeting Monday and having our sprint planning, or should I move that? That is an excellent question. Uh, I don't know the answer to whether or not it's an official holiday, but I suspect it is. Um, it is. Okay. So then we won't be meeting on Monday, but we, 
A lot of places are giving Friday off as well. Uh, I don't think that's an official holiday. I know my kids get the, the day off, which is great. Uh, so, um, so our dev sync might be a little noisier than usual on Friday. Uh, uh, is there anybody who's planning on not being around for that? I'll be here. Awesome. Okay. Then, uh, all right. Is there anything else that we should talk about? I I just concur with your assessment that things should have either an epic or be in a sprint because otherwise I just get lost. Um, and at some point, you know, with all, when we get all that free time, we should you know keep keep doing that Jira pruning and add things that haven't you know that have just been thrown in there. Make sure that they've got epics and stuff. Um, I just think when we when we create epics too, it's like coming back to that document that Chris started, um, we've got to try and do some good thinking around how we construct those epics and make sure that they're like tangible projects with a tangible outcome and um, contained and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. All right. Great. Thanks. So. Yeah, the backlog has 606 issues in it right now. So, and I'm pretty sure a very a large portion of those don't don't have epics. So, um, right. yeah. Okay. Well, that'll be a, a, a fun project. Uh, maybe when we get a, a new hire. <laughs> Here, here's our backlog. <laughs> have some fun. All right. Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> thanks everybody. I'll see you on Friday. All right. Take it easy, guys. Uh, cool. Don't we have a meeting tomorrow too? Oh, probably. Because <laughs> I was commenting to my wife.